I just want to say something that one of my sons said about you today. <laughs> now that he said it, I can't unsee it. How wise I am. Okay. And also, <laughs> I the boys were like, where are you going today? And I said, oh, well, I'm going to go record a podcast. And Luke said, with uh, Scott Kisker and David Watson, he said both of your full names, which I thought was funny. And I said, yes. And he said, you know, I was thinking about it. David's hair looks like one of the Lego head hair. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Plain Truth, a Holy Spirited podcast. I'm Maggie Elmer, and I am here today with David Watson, Scott Kisker, and Matt Reynolds. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Matt is here today because he is going to talk about some very exciting things, specifically a new ministry, right? Yeah, I'm in the process of launching a brand new ministry called Spirit and Truth, and uh, there's some exciting stuff in the works. Nice. Well, tell us a little bit about it. Well, uh, just a little bit about me, I guess. I, I've, I'm a United Methodist pastor. I was pastoring in different capacities in the church for about 12 or 13 years. And then in the last year, I've been working with a, a different ministry, um, kind of works with all different denominations, and really sort of working in a role that would some would describe kind of as a missionary to the United States. So mm. working with people to sort of mobilize everyday Christians to share their faith and make disciples. And so in the process of kind of my past and then my current ministry, God just kind of laid this uh, vision on my heart for a new ministry that could really bring some of the things I've been learning into the Wesleyan world, which is where my heart is, and um, really helping to catalyze local churches, whether they're Methodist or other Wesleyan expressions, to sort of reclaim and return to some of the Wesleyan hallmarks that really ignited our movement in the very beginning. Essentially, you would be a, what's called a parachurch organization. Yeah, that's right. And you would go around to churches and help them recover and incarnate is the word that Scott used earlier and execute Wesleyan traditions. Yeah, but not, it's not about the tradition. It's about embodying what it means to be a Wesleyan and Methodist in the 21st century. Cool. So, Matt, talk a little bit about how you got the inspiration for this and just where the ideas came from. Yeah, I was, um, so like I mentioned a minute ago, I've been serving with this ministry that the, the whole purpose of the ministry really is to catalyze people in churches to help them share the gospel and make disciples. And in many ways, some of the things that I saw happening you know, it's, a, it's always a mixed bag when you're working with churches of all different denominations and styles and all of that. It can get messy. But in the midst of it, I saw some just really hope for the church in the 21st century as everyday people who had never shared their faith before, some of them been in church for decades, uh, started talking about Jesus with other people and uh, seeing people come to Christ for the first time and getting in intentional discipling relationships. And in some ways, some of the, what I encountered outside of the Methodist Church felt more Methodist to me than what I'd experienced inside of the Methodist Church. Yeah. And why, why I kind of love our Wesleyan roots is maybe not so much uh, some of the things that we see in the current day, but what got us here in the first place, a commitment to uh, meeting people where they're at, you know, evangelism that takes the gospel to people rather than expecting them to come to us. Uh, discipleship that's robust and, and intentionally relational that's accountable, you know, that where immediately people are called into a relationship that uh, helps them grow in Christ, doesn't just sort of lead them to a decision and leave them there, you know. Uh, exper- helping people experience the power of the Holy Spirit and recognizing, you know, that uh, the Christian life's not just about what's in your head, but it's also what's in your heart and how you live that out. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of the combination of all of those things. And it uh, doesn't end when you, you know, make a decision for yeah. Christ. That yeah. there's actually, <laughs> that's a beginning for something that God really wants for you, which yeah. is this, you know, fullness of God, you know. Absolutely. I mean, that's kind of, the, the fullness of God. that's kind of understanding the fullness of salvation, right? Mm-hmm. That salvation is not just a, just about our justification, that moment of conversion or whatever. One and done. Yeah, but that that there's this full life that Jesus has invited us into and wanting people to experience that life in Christ. And I think that Wesleyans are uniquely positioned in, in this modern day to offer that hope to the world. Um, but I think it's going to take reclaiming some of what got us here in the first place. And 
that's what I want to see this ministry help to do uh, is to rally Wesleyan-minded leaders around the country together and provide resources and training for churches to actually live out this vision that I that I know got a stirring up in so many different people and in different pockets. So I can't help but think about something that my husband did, not this summer, but summer before last. He had the opportunity to preach at a revival. Um, so we drove to Virginia and preached a three-day revival. He did. I say we, as in I was in the car with our children. <laughs> and he was there too. Which is a, a miracle of God to I live mean, through that. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> the car broke down. But yeah. that's for another podcast. Yeah. Um, but anyway, he preached. That for- was the evil one. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Revival. yeah. So he preached for three days. And it's funny. It. We didn't intend to also end up talking about things like class meetings or band meetings, but as a result of him being there and just interacting with people and then talking to people, these sort of um, types of things came up in conversation. And at the end of the three days, the pastor came to him and said, you know, I mean, people are really excited about this idea, Mm -hmm. this idea of accountability and and intentional, um, spiritual watching over one another in love. And that was, you know, sort of a seed that was planted from that Mm -hmm. happening. And so that what you're talking about makes me think of that a bit. Well, it totally ties in with what I've seen just in the past year is that I think there is a place and and the word revival carries a lot of baggage with it in different circles, but there is a place. And when you look at our Wesleyan history, for set aside times where uh, God shows up in powerful ways and it becomes a catalyst for sustained change in people's lives. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I I think of like uh, camp meetings and things like that, where these set aside times are opportunities that people have carved out, not knowing exactly how the Lord is going to show up, but by creating the space, the spirit shows up in powerful ways. And often, uh, we allow the baggage associated with that stuff to prevent us from pursuing opportunities for God to catalyze change in people's lives. And I think uh, there's a, a necessary recovery that needs to happen in some of that. I mean, we know that truth. Even like I think of when I was a kid, going to church camp or um, different uh, mission trips or key moments in my life where I can look back and I know there's lasting change and shaping that happened in my life because of this specific set-aside time where I allowed room for the Spirit to work. And I think part of what this ministry is going to do is create those intentional set-aside times in local congregations to see how the Spirit might show up and provide room for for the Spirit to catalyze change in people's life that I think has the potential to be life last, like and lasting. to present people the opportunity to say yes. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, you know... you. You set aside time and you say, okay, here's a time where we're going to see what the Holy Spirit will do. And also the church as a mediator of grace is going to actually invite you That's right. to, you know, we're Arminian, to, to actually agree with the change that God wants to do in your life. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and we, we don't do that. We don't do the invitation mm. at the yeah. time. Uh, so even if the Spirit is working we're deciding not to be the mediators of the grace that God wants to use us for. Which which probably accounts for a lot of churches that have zero professions of faith in a given year, or very few professions of faith in a given year. You, ask, you receive not because, because you, you ask, ask not. not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <sighs> well, you know, I, I think, honestly, I think one of the things that has plagued our current sort of church era in America is our... We ask too little of people. Oh, yeah. We ask way too little of people. We, we have really minimized what it means to invite someone to, into the Christian life. And by, I think people are actually hungry to be challenged and to called into something deeper. Um, but often they're not, that's not where they're being led to go. We, you know, our churches are characterized by sort of this sort of come and see mentality, come and, you know, we'll give you all the stuff that you want. You know, we will give you all the programs that we want. We've got the, all the good stuff for your kids, which is fine. But what I find is like uh, in these churches, 
then, I don't know, I talked to pastors and six months after someone's there, they're frustrated because people are still acting like it's our needs to meet, you know, our, our role to meet their needs. Well, that's how we got them in the door in the first place. Right. The invitation uh, becomes the, the message that you're inviting, you know, that you're building into their life. And because our, our invitations in the 21st century American church are so mild and non-existent and sometimes just inviting them in to sort of be consumers, uh, we have created that, that kind of disciple, which yeah. isn't much of a disciple at all. We reinforce the cultural assumption that all people are our consumers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In, in the way in which we often do church, yeah, right? How we structure ourselves as churches is to say, come be with us because we have our act together. We have programs. That's We've right. got a youth program that your kids will like. We've got, you know, uh, a great worship band and they're, they, they're, they're on top of things and the, the worship's going to lead you in a certain direction emotionally and... We've got somebody who's going to give you a good sermon. Yeah. Expectation is a big theme on a lot of podcasts that we record here, expectation. And so I'm wondering, so if somebody asked you, well, how would you communicate what a a healthier or more accurate expectation of the church inviting someone in, what should a person being invited, what should they expect? How would you articulate that? Well, I think I would just say, when we're inviting people to church, uh, we need to stop viewing that as our only mechanism of evangelism. Like inviting someone to church is an evangelistic method. Like I understand why people use that as a method because they, they're inviting them to somewhere where they think they're going to hear about Jesus. But if people themselves actually saw themselves as the multipliers of the faith, the people who've been called the sent ones, all of us as missionaries to convey and embody the gospel right where we live, work, and play— and then invite people into this life with Jesus, then the invitation to church is really more a gathering of believers to worship uh, with a you know, common heart for the Lord, not so much the only, our only substitute for evangelism. So I, I guess I would just view the invitation entirely different um, in that respect. So I don't know. I'm not sure I answered your question. <laughs> no, but I... I... I think it's the it is the beginning of an answer, and I think that that the idea of viewing the invitation is very important. Um, I had a, an experience not too long ago where I had the impulse to invite someone to church, and then allowed sort of the awkwardness of where we were to stop myself because I too am like get freaked out and embarrassed of about what people are going to think and say. But I. One of the things that I felt overwhelmed by in the moment of considering the person before me was how obvious this person's need was. And then realizing that upon inviting, I would also be responsible. Mm -hmm. And that really was something that took me aback, especially since, I mean because I'm married to clergy, I interact with people all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm just constantly Mm -hmm. talking with people and whatever. And so, um, for what, you know, good, bad, or ugly, you know, I don't often invite people to church because I'm already swimming in the ocean of all the people who are in the church. I don't know if that makes sense, but like, you know, I'm, I'm like, I don't know. I, I feel like sometimes I'm on a different side of the fence. But anyway, so the impulse was very strong to do that. But I was also very taken aback by my very, the acute sense of like, you will be responsible for shepherding this connection. You can't just invite and then ditch. And um, yeah, I had to think about that for a second because I realized I was not prepared. And you think about... <clears throat> before Methodism was primarily worship congregation centered and it was mm-hmm. small group centered, mm-hmm. that the small group leader, the, 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 well, you would be invited in worship, in a worship service, to visit a small group. Mm. That was always the invitation. Uh, and the small group leaders, which we called class leaders, we're inviting people to come to that. That was the center, right? So you wouldn't be inviting somebody to come to a worship service. You'd be inviting them to come to your house on a Wednesday night. Right. And, and experience Christian life together. So, Matt, you know, in these revivalistic meetings, then, you know, you, you, 
you create an invitation for people to encounter the Holy Spirit or a space for that to happen, an invitation for them to accept, you know, what God wants to do in their life. After that, let's say someone says yes, you know, yeah. I want to invite Jesus into my life. I want God to change me. I want to be a new person. Then once they make that decision, what what then, you know, what's what's the what happens through your ministry after that? Well, one of the primary goals of this ministry is to use those kind of catalytic events to um, invite people to commit to class and band style discipleship. Okay. So that's one of the primary mechanisms that we want to help churches learn how to live out on the ground level is I think there's a lot of people who have a heart to recover that but don't always aren't always sure exactly where to start to actually launch that in their in their church and um, and I, I think one of the ways that our, our ministry could be a blessing to others is is to provide sort of a, a framework to help implement that style of discipleship in the life of their church and actually, invite people into making that commitment. And the ministry is not about an event. It's about a a sort of, I think you were talking about a year-long process where you help a a congregation. Yeah, what what do you help, you know, in this year-long process, what are you helping a congregation or a group of congregations to do slash be become? Yeah, so it is what what we've kind of designed is a year-long coaching training process that includes some of those kind of uh, catalyst events that we just were talking about, but that's just a piece of the puzzle that um, helps bring people to to a place of decision, opens them up to wanting to to make these kind of new commitments. But uh, it's a process of starts with working with a pastor and leadership of a church uh, through uh, some coaching and training uh, pieces and uh, uses some uh, congregational events like we've talked about and then follows that up with uh, additional coaching and training for six months, and uh, our hope, you know, th- our hope is to to sort of help reclaim again, sort of some Wesleyan hallmarks. But a few of those specifically that we want to help a church reclaim is intentional evangelism. So helping equip everyday people to share their faith in Jesus with other people, so that. Um, just like I was talking about a minute ago, we don't sort of get to check the evangelism box because we invited a person to Christmas Eve service once a year. And that's where I think our current culture is in the church. Like, if I invite someone to Easter, I did my job, I shared the gospel. Well, not exactly. (laughs) You know, that's not the way it works. So uh, helping everyday people see themselves as missionaries right where they live, work, and play. So training them to live in that way. Second is uh, involving them in a very intentional Wesleyan style discipleship, you know, like class and band meetings, like we've just talked about. And a third component is really uh, understanding and, and at least uh, opening people up to experience the power of the Holy Spirit, that this life that they're living with Christ doesn't need to, to be um, uh, just uh, sort of a, a function of what they think. And um, it is driven by what we think, but I'm saying it's it's not just a, a stale robotic religion where you show up and you put in your time on Sunday morning, but that the active spirit of God uh, wants to uh, work through you and in you to transform you and to lead you in the week and, and all of those kinds of things. And so I I think that's a part of the early Methodist movement that we've lost in our current church Mm -hmm. and that I'd like to help uh, recover in in whatever way that we can do that. So where can people find information? Yeah, well, they uh, they can go to our website, spiritandtruth.life, and that's kind of the hub that just... um, we're actually creating kind of a hub for resources. Uh, people like uh, Dr. Watson and Dr. Kisker and many others are going to be helping to contribute uh, to these kind of solid Wesleyan resources that are available through Spirit and Truth. Um, that's also the place where churches who are interested in being a part of this training process uh, can invite Spirit and Truth to come. Uh, it's actually, uh, I know one of the questions that people ask is, well, how much does this cost? It's actually free. Uh, this is a ministry that's being supported by uh, donors from churches and individuals who believe in this vision for the Wesleyan movement in the 21st century and want to see this take root in our country. And so um, there's gonna there's an application process that people can kind of sort of uh, invite Spirit and Truth to come to their region and 
Um, and then we'll kind of assess with them if it's the, the right timing and environment to, to be able to implement these sort of things. Uh, but we want to come and be a blessing uh, to Wesleyan-minded churches. And uh, we're not going to go anywhere that we're not invited. This is just, we're not going to force ourselves on anyone. We just want to be a blessing to the larger church. And so if we can do that, uh, they can, again, find that at spiritandtruth.life, all the information about how to invite us, as well as start to find some of the resources that will be available. I think that'll be a blessing to the church as well. Cool. Do you have a Twitter handle, Matt? Uh, yes, it's super original. It's at Matt Reynolds seven, and uh, <laughs> oh, I like the biblical number seven. Though. That's, oh, yeah. that's my personal Twitter handle. The Twitter handle for the ministry. Well, no, okay, go ahead. Is at Spirit Truth Life all together. One word. One one word. Long several yeah. words. They also can connect to that from the yeah. website. Yeah. Okay, so you have those. If you have questions about Spirit and Truth. Be sure to message Matt on Twitter, either directly, if that's okay, or sure. at Spirit and tr- wait, no, Spirit, Spirit Truth, Truth Life. Life. At Spirit Truth Life on that's Twitter. That's right. That's right. And um, <laughs> we look forward to hearing more about this. And we, you know, we'll be praying for you and awesome. all of that. I thank you so much for being here on the podcast. I just followed at Spirit Truth Life on Twitter. Oh, see, oh. Now. so easy, people. Just That's go incredible. click yeah. and follow. Uh, now you have two followers. We have two followers now. This is a brand new ministry, so... Uh, Anyone that's listening, can uh, you can get in on the ground floor. <laughs> is the that, very, that, very is ground that a good way floor. to say it? Or at least yeah. it will be a brand yeah. new ministry when this podcast airs. When this, uh, <laughs> when this airs. So. Yeah. But I do want to uh, d- thank you all because I've been listening to the podcast for the um, the year that you all have been doing oh, this. Gosh. And honestly, uh, you're, the, the kind of things that you talk about and the vision of this podcast is really um, connects with the heart of what I want this ministry to be about. And so I just appreciate you all, and I want to thank you for the contribution that you're making to this kind of new Wesleyan movement in the 21st century. I think you all are, are awesome. So Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thank thanks, you. Yeah, thanks. We think you're awesome, too. <laughs> oh, gosh. We're all having a group hug. You <laughs> can't see it. Yeah. Yeah, you know David arranged that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a hugger. What can I say? Yeah, you are. Well, thank you for being with us today at Plain Truth, the Holy Spirited Podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hop over to our page on iTunes and rate the podcast because it helps other people find it. And um, we look forward to being with you again next time. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.